Welcome to The Real News. I'm Kim Brown. Do you remember how different things were just a few short months ago? Are you comfortable greeting people with hugs and kisses? The coronavirus pandemic has shifted our entire society, including the way we work, the way we interact, and the way we socialize. However, African-American communities are bearing the brunt of this disease in ways that other communities are not experiencing. What are some of the reasons behind that? And what are some of the emerging behaviors of the virus that could help perhaps save lives as we go forward throughout this pandemic? Well, joining us today to discuss this is Dr. Leon McDougall. Dr. McDougall is the president-elect of the National Medical Association, representing the collective voice of 45,000 African-American physicians. He's also penned an op-ed recently that's gotten a lot of attention, From Katrina to Coronavirus, What Have We Learned? And Dr. McDougall joins us today. Sir, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Thank you for inviting me to talk with you this afternoon. So, Doctor, before we get into some of the reasons why people of color and communities of color are dying at greater numbers uh, than than white people, for example, uh, I wanted to get into some of the emerging information that is coming out about the coronavirus, about how it spread and how people um, who contract the virus, um, how they are being affected if they end up surviving the illness. Um, When we talk about um, the new data that has been released, there's a story that's floating around the internet that says that the coronavirus can now travel up to 13 feet airborne. Um, What are some of the other ways that people are contracting this virus? Can you contract it via touch, um, via blood? Um, How is this virus transmitted? So respiratory droplets, uh, that would be a primary mode of transmission. And then also touching surfaces that have been infected by someone who has coronavirus. Uh, In medical school, we call those uh, fomites. (laughs) And so coming into contact with a uh, surface that has been contaminated. Uh, So... Uh, So what you're saying, uh, Kim Brown, really makes it important that we follow recommendations for prevention of transmission. And Dr. McDougall, what would that be? Uh, One, uh, from a, we just had resurrection uh, weekend, right? And uh, one of uh, the best ways from a a uh, spirituality standpoint, a church going standpoint would be uh, worship in place. And what does that mean? It means worship in place in your home <laughs> and uh, also uh, uh, shelter in place. So what does that mean? Shelter in place in your home, uh, not at the uh, local store, not at the restaurant. Uh, and if you should happen to go into public settings, uh, you should be wearing a mask. Now, uh, one caveat to that, uh, Kim Brown. So uh, there have been reports of African-American males uh, being thought of as criminals and thought of being in the place of business uh, to do things other than to purchase a product or item. And so I, what I've been recommending is that uh, African-American males, especially if uh, when wearing the mask, maybe choose a, a white color or a, a light blue color similar to the medical mask, or actually if you can get a medical mask versus having like a black mask. And then if you got a black mask and a hoodie on, then there are already these implicit biases out there. And uh, I so just something to keep in mind when we get recommendations uh, to wear a mask. And I got another good story. I got a good story for you, Kim Brown. So uh, when uh, I'm hearing all the, all the chatter on television about, 
all the hand sanitizers are sold out at the stores, right? So I went to the store and that was correct. I mean, the whole shelf was empty. But guess what? Right next to that empty space was a whole shelf full of hand soap oh. with the dispensers. <laughs> so what does that mean, right? So uh, you shouldn't be shaking anybody's hand anyway. So go ahead and buy some of that hand soap and put it in your restroom and uh, in your bathrooms and 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 uh, and use it and and with some water. So so soap and water, washing your hands, warm water for uh, twenty seconds. That's recommended. And there's plenty of soap in the store. I checked. The whole you, shelf full. You, you, you are right about that, Dr. McDougall. I don't think soap is getting it, it, its proper respect uh, these <laughs> days, especially when, when juxtaposed with hand sanitizer. But I, I wanted to circle back to something that you mentioned. Uh, because it, in addition to um, a number of pre-existing conditions that uh, uh, so many people in the Black community are dealing with, in addition to having to protect yourself going out in public um, from contracting COVID-19, it, it, it's, it's the racism that will also get you. And racism was getting a good number of us before this pandemic even erupted. And, and the advice that you just gave Black men in particular uh, about wearing certain types of masks, I, I would assume to appear as non-threatening as possible when being out in public spaces um, is sound advice. And it, it's not dissimilar from the advice that African-American parents give their teenage uh, children when they begin to drive about how to best interact with police in order to save your life. Um, but the Centers for Disease Control listed obesity, and hypertension as two of the main underlying conditions um, which can precipitate hospitalization uh, should those patients come in contact or become infected with coronavirus. So what is it about these underlying conditions that make people more susceptible? And why do black people have more of these underlying conditions than other communities? So, uh, so let's, let me go back to what you spoke to earlier, you touched on racism, and then we went into other these other comorbidities or other illnesses that uh, are more uh, prevalent in the African American population. So, so, so let's 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 redirect to the process of even getting tested, right? So there's scarce. There's scarcity in regards to the testing kits available. So to address that, algorithms have been developed to ask questions. So there is a screen before the screen. And what we're finding out is that more European Americans are giving the right answers to this test and are getting screened. And, uh, and it doesn't quite fit with the fact that African Americans, Latinx, uh, American Indian, uh, Alaska Natives are are being affected more pronouncedly when they contract uh, COVID nineteen, and so uh, even from the very beginning, getting that screening, there's some disparities. Now, let's I'll give you another example. Uh, you watch your nightly news and uh, they said, well, we have these breaking news. Uh, they've set up COVID-19 screening centers and show the, you know, the, the SUV driving in, right? And people getting their nose, nasal swabs and so forth. Uh, but uh, Kim Brown, what they're not saying is that uh, many of these same drive-in centers, they're are opportunities for people to walk in, right? But that's not being advertised. And so if you don't have a car, and, uh, and on top of that, if you don't have a car, so now you don't have a car, there's access available for you through walk-in, but you are unaware. So there needs to be public service announcements, culturally, sensitive, multilingual that speak to that. So 
if you know you don't have a car, you're just going to kind of wave the white flag. I don't have a car. So what am I going to do? Then, in addition to the screening questions that I spoke to, one of my colleagues in another state, I'm in Ohio, was saying that uh, one actually needs to have a prescription from a physician to get screened. So we've identified another barrier. So what if you don't have a primary care physician or a relationship with a physician? That puts you at another uh, disadvantage. Now I'm gonna introduce something else. So many of these cities with the high prevalence of COVID-19 and the sheltering in, they've limited mass transportation. So now you're black or brown, uh, you're in a high density uh, city, they've limited mass transportation. And so how are you even supposed to get to the testing center? If you, for some reason, pass the test, okay, and now you have to get on a train or bus to get to where you need to go for the testing, if you know that the walk-in is even available. So uh, these are some issues that are not discussed much. So Kim Brown, that's why I'm glad we're ha having this uh, conversation here today. And also with the National Medical Association, we're uh, partnering with uh, Rainbow Push with uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson and putting together a 10 point agenda to help address some of these uh, disparities, such as, for example, with limitations in travel in uh, communities that are uh, health professional shortage areas and the like, uh, actually deploying mobile COVID-19 testing uh, centers, uh, testing through a mobile uh, testing unit and targeting those communities that have lower access and higher risk uh, to developing uh, COVID-19 infection. Also, in when algorithms are used to screen uh, who and who should not uh, receive the test, we're advocating that African Americans, Latinx, uh, American Indians, uh, uh, Native Alaskans should uh, receive a priority uh, 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 rating in regards to the weighting of whatever criteria uh, is being used. And then there's uh, this whole issue of persons who are incarcerated. So uh, Kim Brown, there are people who are incarcerated uh, in jail that have not gone to trial, have not been convicted, and they're in a setting where they're at higher risk for contracting uh, COVID-19 coronavirus and uh, and only due to the fact that they were unable to post bail that they are in jail. So and that's another pool of people who we think uh, there should be um, uh, mechanisms to uh, quickly adjudicate uh, those circumstances and uh, have them until that trial comes up, either some type of home arrest or whatever uh, mechanism that's available to help address uh, those uh, concerns. So- Well, do Dr. Lot. McDougall, let, let, me, let me hop in here for a minute because you, you raise a number of interesting points. And to be frank, people who are in the top levels of our federal government, especially uh, amongst those who work in the public health sector, uh, there is no way that these outcomes that you described could not have been foreseen in advance. Uh, again, as you mentioned, with the prison population, we already know or we had an idea of how contagious this virus is. Um, it, it wasn't a, a question of of, of if, but rather of when. And discussing Black communities, Indigenous communities, and Latinx communities who have already uneven access to healthcare, uneven access to transportation, um, uneven access to information in some cases um, about what to do and what not to do in the midst of a pandemic. It, you know, we have, we are in the midst of this wildfire, but the kindling 
had long been laid. Is this ineptitude from the federal level in their response, in their lack of preparedness for this? Surely they had to have known that vulnerable populations like the black population um, in, in many cities with, with the circumstances that you've outlined and that I've outlined, surely they had to know that these groups would have been impacted first and hardest. So uh, Kim Brown, uh, very good uh, a proposition there in regards to uh, this issue. And so, it reflects back on, and I shared earlier about the article that I wrote from Katrina to coronavirus and how the National Weather Service was able to track the impending strike of Hurricane Katrina. And uh, with this uh, coronavirus, uh, the national intelligence agencies, the Centers for Disease Control, and the World Health Organization were tracking the impending strike of coronavirus. So that's aligned with what you are saying. And uh, with the prior uh, administration, an actual pandemic uh, planning and response team had been a assigned uh, by President Obama. And that group, that task force, was disbanded. So, yes, uh, people have known that a pandemic such as this was inevitable, and uh, that's what makes uh, this November important for people in the audience. Sitting at home is not an option. Learning what the issues are uh, uh, will uh, better serve uh, our communities. So uh, you bring up a very good point. Well, doc doctor, I mean, sitting at home has to be an option <laughs> at this point, does it not? I mean, there has to be alternatives provided uh, to going physically into the polls so to vote. Mail, that, so that, I'm in Ohio. Uh, we just got four mail-in ballots, <laughs> ballots in the mail. So mail-in ballots are important and should be utilized wherever possible. Well, doctor, to wrap up our conversation, you know, if if you had the ear of every community of color nationwide, because it is quite clear that the federal response is lacking, depending on what state you are, the state response is lacking to the black, brown and indigenous communities. Tell us what can we do to save ourselves in the midst of this pandemic? So we've gone over some of this already, staying six feet apart, no mass gatherings, uh, worship in place, and that means at home, uh, shelter in place, and that means at home. And I know that shelf of hand sanitizer is empty, but look, uh, turn your head to the right and get some <laughs> hand soap and wash your hands for uh, 20 seconds in warm water. And uh, those are some of the main things and just really, this is serious, wear the mask out in public. And we talked about the precautions too for African-American males. Uh, uh, the National Medical Association with Rainbow Push, we're gonna be putting out a 10 point agenda, even going into more of the details, flushing out what we were talking about earlier. Uh, and so this is a, a very serious issue that the African-American modern cultural community should be uh, very well versed in and advocate for yourself, take care of yourself uh, due to the uh, points that you uh, importantly are brought out here today in this conversation. All right. Well, we appreciate your time today. We've been speaking with Dr. Leon McDougall. He is the president-elect of the National Medical Association, representing over 45,000 African-American physicians. He's been speaking to us today from Cleveland. Dr. McDougall, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. And thank you very much, uh, Kim Brown, and to all your staff that helped get us set up here today. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thanks again, and thank you for watching The Real News Network. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to.
stay up on the videos.